Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we'll get started in just a second. I just want to say um, a hello and let everyone know that this session is being recorded. Um, there is also the option for closed captions. You can um, select that within the Zoom features um, if you'd like to turn those on. We will also be sharing this slide deck and um, the recording after, um, after the winter. Institute wraps up uh, because this is a session that's part of the Winter Institute. So there are many, many events going on um, concurrently. And I will make a little pitch for that um, and just share the link to the wiki. There are events the rest of this week. So encourage you to find other ones to register for if you haven't already. Um, and yeah, thank you again for joining us today. Um, this workshop is around data visualization, specifically geared for teaching and learning projects. We're gonna be focusing on um, basically some best practices around uh, visualizations that could apply to non-teaching and learning projects, but because that's the capacity of the work that we do, that's kind of where we're coming at, um, at this workshop from. Um, so my name is Trish, I should introduce myself. Um, I know some of you already. Um, I'm an evaluation and research consultant with the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology, and I'm joined by my colleague, Natasha, um, who's a scholarship of teaching and learning facilitator. Um, throughout the session, please feel free to pop questions in the chat. We will have some time. Um, hopefully we'll have time for a little bit of a break at the middle, um, as well as some time at the end to do some deeper dives into your questions. Um, but do feel free to post your questions in the chat and then we'll see if it's something that a topic we're going to cover. If, um, we can take a break to, to address those concerns as they come up. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to my colleague, Natasha. Great. So, um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the session today. Um, just before we get started, um, I just want to do a land acknowledgement. So, um, I'd like to acknowledge and honor the existence of the first people um, from the land where I'm sharing with you today um, by acknowledging that I'm here currently on the land of the Musqueam um, in this place that we know today as UBC. Um, I would encourage you to take a moment to um, kind of reflect on where you're joining us from um, and consider and give, give respect to the lands that you are situated in. Um, I appreciate this place uh, so much because it provides me with opportunities to learn, um, to work, to play, um, and I would like to just continue to state that I'm committed to learning more um, beyond just um, just what the land, uh, who the land belongs to, but learning more about um, the processes of decolonializing and indigenizing um, our work and play here. So I'm just going to throw into the chat um, a link. If you don't already know the lands that you are currently situated on, um, this is an opportunity for you to for you to discover that. So we'll get started um, today with just a quick outline of our workshop. Um, starting with a little comic that is from XKCD that I just really enjoy. Um, so just kind of a brief overview of, um, of our presentation today. We're going to go over um, kind of the basic principles of data visualization. We've got a quick kind of introductory um, section. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what is the purpose of your visualization? What, uh, what are you hoping these visualizations will accomplish for you? Um, what is the context that you're coming from? We'll talk a bit um, about kind of basic do's and don'ts um, around data visualization, and that will be the bulk of our um, of our session. So we'll talk about a few different types. We'll talk about bar um, and column charts. We'll talk about line plots and scatter plots. We'll talk about some less common visualizations and a little bit about how to visualize qualitative data as well. Um, that is something that we've heard from from past participants that they'd like to know more about. So we've added a little bit of a section on that. Um, and then we'll also discuss uh, kind of best practices um, overall for visualizing data um, and accessibility considerations that you should keep in mind when you're planning um, data, data viz. And then we'll end with um, a time for questions um, and a list of potential resources that might be useful for you moving forward. Um, and as Trish mentioned, we will share the slides afterwards. So um, there will be references on some of the slides um, and links, and you can refer to those for uh, more detailed information, more advanced information on, on each of those different topics. So just as we get started, I'm going to put a link into the chat for us here. Um, we would love to know what brought you to today's session. Um, so this is a link to a Jamboard, and you can just use um, on the kind of left side of the Jamboard, you'll notice that there's these little sticky notes. Um, you can just add a sticky note um, and add your response in there.
Great, so we've got a few responses. I'll just read them out as they kind of come in. So um, a few folks mentioning looking for new ideas, um, looking to make more interesting slides, looking to improve my teaching um, and my materials for learning, looking for better ways to show data, um, looking for how to represent uh, qualitative data. So great, I'm glad we've got that a little additional piece in there. Hopefully that will be a good uh, foundational start for that. Um, how to integrate images in a helpful way in reports um, and teaching. Uh, teaching data viz, looking for some in inspiration and new tips. Uh, if you have any suggestions for us, we'd also love if you wanted to throw more things into the chat. Um, we're always, we're all here to learn from each other and we're always happy to, um, yeah, to hear from you. Um, building on a foundation of knowledge regarding data visualizations, um, learning about accessibility. Um, a couple people mentioned qualitative data, um, looking for more catchy ways to share information. Um, yeah, quite a few, quite a few different uh, bits and pieces. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to get you started on that journey. Um, yes, I can throw the link right in there for you. Um, hopefully we'll be able to kind of get started on that journey today and then um, send you off with some resources that will help you um, if there are particular areas that you already have a bit of a foundation in and want some kind of more advanced knowledge in or um, things that, that you want to pursue further. Uh, great, so before we get started with principles and guidelines, um, we would encourage you to think about um, why. Uh, so think about why uh, you're trying to visualize this data. Um, what is the story that you're trying to tell? Um, so remember that as the person creating the figure, you are the one uh, doing the interpretation of data. So the first thing we would encourage you to think about is who is your audience? Um, is the audience a novice? Is, is the audience an expert in the field, an expert in the type of data that you are presenting? Um, do they have a background in this area? Do they know what you're talking about? Will they know the story that you're trying to tell? Um, and if not, how can you simplify so that um, users of all abilities or users who may not be super familiar with um, your topic or the type of visualization will still be able to pull out the information that they need? Um, so these considerations are kind of true more broadly and particularly um, important questions to be asking when you're focused on um, making sure that your um, data visualizations are inclusive and accessible. And then the second thing uh, we would encourage you to think about, big picture question, is what is your audience trying to learn from this image? Um, so how should the reader benefit from this visualization? Consider how um, how your graph will help the user um, understand insights from the data and consider what the story is that you're trying to tell. So are you, are you trying to learn more about the data? Are you doing more of an exploratory thing? Um, or is the goal explanatory to really explain and tell a story? Um, great, so we've already got some things happening in the chat about um, cool recommendations for visualization accessibility. Um, thanks for sharing that, Nadia. We will get into that later as well. Um, happy to have uh, more resources at our fingertips and, and add those onto our list as well. Um, so just moving on to kind of broad principles of data viz, um, I really like this quote uh, by Edward Tuft, who's an American statistician. Um, and he says, graphical excellence gives the viewer the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in the smallest space. Um, and I just really like this, this nice, concise little sound bite. Um, the question really is, can you understand it in five seconds? Um, if the visual that you're using adds more complexity than the writing, um, than the text that you already have, think about whether um, you actually need it, think about whether it's contributing anything. So the goal of um, visualization is really to, to reduce complexity, to um, make it easier and more accessible for someone to be able to look at something and grab the information that they need um, as quickly as possible. And so with that in mind, um, we have kind of the basic principles of uh, good data visualization. Um, so a good visualization first um, is accurate. It's representing quantities accurately, um, or it's representing data accurately if you're looking at qualitative, um, more qualitative data. Um, secondly, it is clearly indicating how the different pieces relate to one another. So what is the relationship with, between the variables, between the categories? Um, is it a continuous thing? Are they discrete? Clearly indicating how all of the different pieces um, 
interact with one another. And then the third is that it makes obvious how people should be using the information. So your graphical representation should highlight, um, it should really be able to, to highlight what you want people to pull out from it um, very, very quickly and very easily. Depending on what you're trying to do, um, there might be a couple of additional things you might want to consider. So um, you might want to consider making it easy for uh, people to compare different quantities. And you may want to make it easy for people to see a ranking or a ranked order. Um, so those are kind of additional optional pieces, but these are kind of the three big principles of data visualization. Um, so we've got a little bit of a participatory component. Um, the question we've got here is looking at these four graphs um, quickly, which of these graphs do you think has the highest mean? So we're going to open a Zoom poll, and if you just want to um, throw in your response. When we talk about being able to pull out data quickly and easily. I'll give us about 10 more seconds. All right, Trish, do you mind sharing the results with us? Um, so we've got quite a spread of responses, um, which is what we usually get. Um, so some people say one or the other. Um, about a third of the respondents say more than one of the above. Um, I won't spend too much time on it. I'd be curious to know those of you who said more than one of the above, which ones you think. Um, but but this is a, a kind of an interesting illustration of um, a couple of different things, of, of kind of ease of being able to pull out information and also um, of the importance of visualizing data for yourself before you start visualizing data for others. Um, so this is actually called Anscombe's Quartet. Um, and all of these, all four of these graphs have the same mean, um, the same variance, and the same correlation value. Um, so they have a correlation of about 0.8. Um, and as I mentioned, the goal here is really to highlight um, kind of the importance of, of visualizing data for yourself um, before you are um, before you are moving on to, to providing visualizations for others. Um, so the goal here is to look at, um, are there outliers or other anomalies in your data? So for example, looking at graphs um, C or D, um, being able to visualize the data here will give you an immediate response, um, an immediate uh, kind of clarification on, um, on whether there might be errors in processing, whether there might be an outlier in your data, um, and help you consider how you might best present your data for your um, audience especially if you're going to use things like means or medians to showcase the data um, because when the uh, data isn't normally distributed these can be kind of misrepresented and that's where data visualization can really help you um, tell the story more clearly um, the other benefit of visualizing for yourself before you are visualizing for others is that it can help you identify anything that might be missing. Um, so perhaps missing responses in a particular category um, or something like that, and then just kind of generally better understanding the data at large. So we would encourage you to think about data visualization as something that you do early on for yourself um, before you make nicer versions um, to share, share more broadly. So with that, um, we'll get into kind of our most common figure types, um, and we're going to get started with bar and column charts, um, which are probably quite familiar to all of you. Um, just a brief overview of what they're useful for. Um, so bar and column charts are best when you're comparing different categories of data, and they're most useful for plotting means um, or, or medians. So um, plotting things like grades or scale means or Likert scale responses, um, so ranges of values as well. Um, so once again, um, I'm going to ask for a little bit of participation. Um, so we're going to present you with a problematic bar chart, um, and I would encourage you to take a minute and type out your answer into the chat window, um, and I'll give everybody about 90 seconds to get their answer in there, and then we'll press enter at the same time. 
um, so that everyone can go through and read all of the responses simultaneously. So we'll show you the chart, take a couple of seconds, don't press enter quite yet, and then I'll let you know uh, once we're ready for you to press enter. I'll give us about another 15 seconds. All right, so when you're ready, um, please go ahead and press enter and then we'll go through and look at all of the responses. Great, lots of responses, thank you. All right, so we've got percentages don't add up to 100 in each year. Um, so there might be some issues with the actual accurate representation of the data um, on this bar chart. Too many categories, not enough color division, not enough space. Hard to make direct comparisons between different years. There's too much data. So a few people have mentioned too many categories. It's impossible to make comparisons. Bars are too small. The color categories are distracting, hard to figure out. Um, a lack of clarity on kind of what we're supposed to be pulling out from this. Um, too much overwhelming information, bad choices of color. Um, great. So, so many problems. Um, yeah, it, it's hard to understand. It's hard to pull out information. It's unclear why of the chart is um great <laughs> so i just want to add in that this was a figure that i made for a project i was working on and this was basically the default that was offered to me in excel so basically taking all the data that i had i was like let's just throw everything in there and see what it looks like um so i just want to make another case for it's fine to you know plot the data for yourself at first to sort of just see like okay what does it all look like what is kind of happening um but also like a very strong case, like please just don't use the default options that Excel gives you. <laughs> Excel is a very powerful and wonderful tool. You could do many, many things with it, but just using the defaults um, is not the best choice. <laughs> so I'm sure we've all used or seen uh, graphs similar to this at conferences or at various points in time in our, in our work. Um, our goal here is to figure out how to break down um, a chart, a chart like this, into into something that's more readable, legible, helpful. Um, so we'll go through um, a few kind of points on how to make your data cleaner for a bar and column chart. Um, so the first point that we'll make here is is a pretty simple one, um, but one that has a lot of impact. Um, so ranking your items in a helpful way. Um, if you have a small number, we would encourage you to rank by the count or the percentage. We would typically encourage you to use the percentage because it does give a better, a more kind of representative picture. Um, and if you have a large number of items that you really need to, um, to get across, ranking alphabetically and then highlighting key points. We'll talk about a few ways to highlight um, in the next little bit, but, but pulling out, um, you know, grayscale versus color to highlight the things that you need. Um, this version kind of uses a subset of the data from the previous slide, but to tell a specific story. Um, so here it's much more streamlined, it's much clearer, um, it's much easier to pull out the information that you're looking for. Um, so moving on to talking about highlighting, um, using perceptual features to your advantage to highlight what is important for the viewer to focus on. So in some cases, you don't want to remove all of the rest of the data, but you do want to show um, particular items in, in kind of that, that the reader is meant to focus on. Um, so in this case, you can do um, a few things to make the data pop a little bit more. Um, so here we've got um, all of the bars measuring uh, kind of the same dependent variable, so there's no need for these different colors. Um, this only serves to kind of distract the reader further. Um, so by using a labeled axis, um, you're removing that kind of distracting uh, legend on the side there. Um, you're removing a visual feature that doesn't actually add any information, um, and then color is only being used to highlight where you want the attention to be drawn. 
Labeling axes is also um, a best practice when it comes to accessibility, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, later. But if you're thinking about, uh, for example, someone who may have um, impairments with color vision, um, this legend is absolutely useless um, when you're looking at these different bars. So labeling the axis is always a best practice that we would recommend that you do. Thinking a little bit about stacked plots, um, which we've often seen used, particularly kind of in teaching and learning contexts, think about how um, you might best kind of split that data to compare multiple values within each category. So if you're trying to look at multiple different factors, um, stack plots don't really allow for easy comparisons across groups. If you look at this um, on its own, it's, it's quite challenging to, to break up each of those different pieces. Whereas if you break it up, um, it allows for much easier comparison across all of those different categories. So breaking up that stack plot gives you a really clear picture. It's much easier to pull out, particularly kind of those that dark blue and the turquoise um, and the pink bars, um, because from the from the stacked plot, it's it's really difficult to pull out that information. Um, another kind of minor point, some of these are, are kind of bigger pictures. Some of these are really small, practical kind of tips and tricks, um, but they do make a difference. Think about using a column chart instead of a bar chart if you have labels that are long and need to be there. So we would always encourage you um, to consider how to shorten your labels as much as possible. But if you need to keep long labels, we would encourage you to rotate the graph so that the labels run along the y-axis and the numerical scales along the x-axis. So turning a column chart into a bar chart. Um, so thinking a little bit more um, in detail about Likert scale uh, or Likert type scale data in particular. Um, this is often something that comes up with teaching and learning projects in particular. Um, we often are surveying our, our students or our um, TAs and asking them uh, for their feedback on different bits and pieces. Um, so a couple of uh, kind of tips and tricks for Likert data in particular. We would encourage you to always be mindful of uh, sorting positive or strongly agree data from largest to smallest or smallest to largest, um, including a legend at the top when appropriate. Um, so instead of doing what we have on the left here, um, where again, things aren't really in order, this is pretty similar to our principle of ranking order, um, it's much easier to pull out um, kind of what 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 did students say the best things about and the worst things about um, at a glance when things are ordered in a in a logical and helpful way. So showing that distribution of data um, kind of provides information on all of those responses. Where just providing a mean alone on a Likert scale may not provide enough actually, enough information, um, but this allows you to pull out that information quickly and easily. The other thing. Um, that we would encourage you to do is um, if you do need to see kind of all of those different components, we would encourage you to use 100% stacked plots on an equal spread. Um, so here we can see that um, kind of in the picture on the left here, we've got different numbers of students have responded to different um, to, to different questions. Um, we would encourage you to go um, instead of instead of using numbers, we would encourage you to use percentages and then to make sure that the data is on an equal spread so that you can really compare what actually is happening across those different items. We would encourage you um, to also be mindful if you do this, that if groups are um, really unequal in between those different categories, people might misinterpret this data to see them as equal. So being mindful of when it's appropriate to use that stacked plot versus not, um, or the caveats that you might need to provide if you do use a visualization like that. So this tells us, um, you know, 50% of the respondents felt this way, uh, given the same size, which may or may not be equal across the groups. So just thinking of alternatives, uh, when a bar chart is too messy, there are a few um, potential alternatives that you might consider using. Um, I also just want to highlight that all of these visualizations are created in Excel. These are meant to be um, simple, straightforward. We're not trying to teach you, um, you know, fancy versions uh, using software that you may not be familiar with. All of these, um, all of these are fairly straightforward to do in Excel, including the um, the kind of splitting the data, doing the stacked plots, doing what's on this um, on this slide as well. So um, consider a slope chart, um, particularly if you're looking at kind of changes over time. 
um, and this will kind of lead us into into talking a little bit about line line charts as well. Um, so think about a slope chart for um, changes over time, and you can you can do it um, as one large chart, or you can also quite easily split it into um, having each of the different lines um, kind of portrayed side by side. Um, which might be helpful if you're trying to pull out particular trends and, and differences um, in the shape of the distribution across those different um, categories. We would also encourage you um, to consider that sometimes um, a lollipop chart might help you compare data more easily. So when you have uh, two categories of data that you're comparing, it's a little bit harder to see um, on, a, on a bar chart here. Um, you can kind of see the distribution of um, you know, the orange bars versus the blue bars, you can tell that sometimes the orange bars are higher, but you need to do quite a bit more work to see that. Um, whereas if you use a lollipop chart, that can be something that might uh, be more helpful for visualizing. Okay, it's really easy for me to pull out, you know, where the blue ones are higher, where the orange ones are higher and that kind of thing. If you're trying to compare between two groups. So we'll take a pause here for a minute. Um, do we have any questions? Um, anything we'd like to chat more about? Um, please feel free to unmute yourself, um, or if you'd prefer, feel free to put it in the chat and I'm happy to read the question out loud um, so that we have that um, available to us. All right, I think, I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So maybe we'll just take a quick little break. Um, if anyone needs, our session is supposed to be 90 minutes. I suspect we'll run a little bit short, but we always have questions um, at the end. So even though the slide deck might end early, I suspect we might be running a little longer. So I'm just gonna, um, my clock says 157. So just give a three minute break. Um, if you need to grab another coffee, um, take a quick bathroom break. Um, and then we'll continue from there. Um, so we've got another good question. So do you recommend using Excel to generate graphs or are there other tools you'd recommend for beginners? Um, so I'll, I can just speak to Excel. Um, I think when I started using Excel, um, I, I've always kind of thought of it as, as just kind of, you know, this is what you use if you don't really have other options available to you. Um, but as I did mention, there, there is quite a bit you can do in Excel. And um, as, we've, as we were working through um, kind of creating this uh, slideshow and, and reading a couple of resources that we can recommend to you at the end, um, there, is a, uh, there is a fantastic book, um, which is by, Stephanie Evergreen, um, and it's a fantastic book, um, and she's got a great website as well, which we can put into the chat, um, of, of how to use Excel to make kind of more complex things than you thought Excel was capable of, really, um, in, a, in a fairly straightforward way. And then I'll let Trish speak to other options as well. Sure. So I'm just posting, uh, someone asked about the slides, and they'll end up in the, oh, there we go, Ainsley's got that there. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Duncan. <laughs> I'm, I'm appreciating everyone being on the on top of it for us. Um, so Duncan just shared um, a link to Stephanie's book, which is fantastic. Um, I read it about a year ago and was so inspired. Um, it was one of the motivations for putting together this workshop was uh, there were just so many great tips and tricks and um, everything in her book, she, she uses Excel as the platform. So, um, and she has a great like, model for like is this better for beginners or do you have to be an excel ninja to do this um so it's a nice inspiration to kind of get a sense of like well i like the way this figure looks but is it going to be too hard for me to make so that's just my extra pitch for um that book in terms of other tools um i have used r um in r studio for making visualizations i don't really recommend it for beginners like you do need to have a little bit of a programming coding not necessarily background, but just like mindset. Um, so R can be awesome and it can make really beautiful visualizations and things that are quite complex. Um, it's also nice if you're making repeated visualizations, so it's easy to just reuse sort of the template you have, um, but I wouldn't recommend it for beginners. Um, I do think that Excel has amazing options. Um, I know I made that case about that hideous figure that we used as the example. Um, again, that's really just like, if you go with the default that Excel gives you, 
you'll end up with a pretty decent figure, but you really want to go back to basically everything Natasha's brought up to, to date um, in terms of making your figure more accessible, easier to read, and really that key point of like, what is the data that you're trying to showcase? Who is your audience? What do they need to know from the data that's there? So um, yeah, I, I think Excel is a great, a great place to start. Um, and then if you're a little, a little, if you have that background and you're comfortable in R, I think R could do some amazing things. There's a lot of um, resources as well for making different types of figures online. It's an open source tool, so um, the community is fantastic for providing tips and tricks for things. Um, so if you find yourself kind of going down a path of becoming more and more in love with data visualizations, then I think um, that could be a, a place for you to to consider for your next your next venture into the data viz world. See if there are any other questions. Thank you, Ainsley, for posting that wiki link. So that's where the slides will be available um, shortly after the workshop. They'll be able to, uh, once our amazing organizers have a chance to, to post them, they'll be available there, as well as slides for any other Winter Institute session. Uh, okay, so I'm not seeing any other questions, in which case I will continue on. Okay. So um, the next piece that I want to talk about moving, moving away from bar plots um, is line and scatter plots, which are another common visualization. So these are really great um, for things like temporal data for um, in the context of teaching learning, looking at things like changes over term or changes over years. So um, if you're thinking about how motivation shifts over multiple years in a series of courses, um, or looking at something like pre-post data, so you know how student knowledge on a specific topic change from the beginning of the term to the end of the term, as well as things like continuous data, so things like student grades. So um, again, looking at some sort of best practices and ways to make your data clearer. So um, the first one is just um, reducing clutter. So as we saw with bar plots, um, you know, just because you have access to all of the data doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, or the default is the best way to, to pull it out. Um, so you can do something like highlighting meaningful data. So you can see that's already been done a little bit in this chart. So what could have happened is you might have shown all of those lines. So the ones that are grayed out are other countries that are being displayed, um, but they're not being highlighted. So here only five countries are being displayed to kind of pull out what that data is and how it looks across the years. A way to make that um, even more clear, like, easier to visualize um, is by um, looking at by moving that axis over or sorry moving the legend over so Natasha mentioned this in one of the plots earlier so having uh, the labels next to the lines themselves um, it helps reduce any sort of um, if there if anyone has an issue with a color impairment it makes it easier for them to see which lines match up with which you don't have to jump from the top of the bar um, or the top of the plot to the bottom to kind of say, okay, which one is the purple one? Where is Nepal or where is Germany? Which, where does that match up? So it makes it a little bit easier to process. Um, and then um, I have another example here. Um, oh, so this is basically looking at the same type of principle, but looking at a scatter plot. Um, so again, the way you can use color. So in that last example, I, I showcased how, um, some of the, the items were grayed out so that the plots or the countries that we wanted to focus on would be highlighted. Um, so you can see that here we have all of the um, five areas are, are on display, but what you might wanna do is pull out a subset of data. So by doing something like changing the title, so between these two figures, is you can pull out um, kind of the emphasis that you wanna make. Again, this really depends on what you're trying to do with the data and what, what the message behind the data is and what you're trying to tell. Um, if you're trying to tell a story of what the rate is for your, um, each region, then of course the data on the left makes more sense. But if you're trying to do something like highlight um, European countries, then you can do that by uh, only having some of the countries uh, highlighted. And so it does show the overall distribution of the data and that there's a positive relationship there. Um, but you're really focusing on one subset, one population. Something um, I want to highlight and to have people be mindful of is with scatter plots, so like this one here, 
it can be easy to jump to the conclusion that there's a correlation between data. So looking at something like um, G, uh, GDP and immigration rate, you might say, oh, there's a positive correlation between these two, fa these two factors. Um, I don't know this data set. It's, it's an example that we pulled from online. Um, so it's possible that there is a significant correlation, um, but it's also possible that there's not. Uh, so you just wanna be careful it's easy for people to jump to that conclusion that there's a significant correlation between the data. So just being mindful when you're presenting your data um, that if you're going to do any additional statistical analyses that you make that clear and that that's included in um, your presentation. And or if you're not going to do those additional um, analyses that you also let people know that, you know, it looks like there's a trend that there's a positive relationship. However, you know, a statistical analysis wasn't done to ensure that that's actually the relationship that's there. So um, you can certainly talk about, you know, it looks like there's a trend in the data here, that there's a positive relationship. But if you don't have access to that actual statistical analysis, just be mindful that people might jump to the conclusion that there's something happening that might not be. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to another um, Another poll. So um, pie charts aren't very common, but um, I shouldn't say they aren't. I should say they are very common, but I wish we wish that they were less common. Um, and we'll make a, a case for why that is. Um, I'm just going to put on another poll here. So just going to ask you to again, um, looking at this figure just quickly, I'll, I'll give 30 seconds for this so that people aren't thinking too deeply about it. Which area do you think is the largest? while looking at the current version of this. Excellent job, everyone. A lot of people, 88% of people indicating um, that area one is the largest, um, a few people indicating area five. Um, so you are correct, area one is the largest, but it is kind of hard to tell and you can't really tell like, okay, maybe five is the next largest, but I don't know what the difference between two, three, and four is. It's quite difficult to tell. Um, this is a bar plot um, of the same data and just really highlights um, it's really hard to compare the slices in a pie chart. Um, so even though many of you got it right, just seeing this visual on its own, you don't get a, a sense of, okay, well, how much of the pie chart is it? Is it about a quarter? Is it more than a quarter? You're not getting any type of information. Um, so I, I'm not enamored with the, the chart that's on the right. Um, that, that would be my preferred bar chart method. <laughs> we'll give you some examples in a minute, but um, just, as a sense to get, you know, these are all different values. And so presenting a, part, a pie chart like this, you really don't get a sense of what the data is. Again, the data isn't labeled. There are many other problems with the figure, but um, it's just a, a case against pie charts. They really make it hard for people to distinguish the proportion of data that's within that area. Um, so we're just gonna talk a little bit um, again, about pie charts and, and um, another less common visualization, less a common that should be less common visualization, which is also bubble plots, um, because they have the same features. It makes it really hard to compare areas, and it's rarely the best option for presenting data. So, um, similar to the last one with these bubble plots, um, with this one at least they do some of the items do have. Um, the amounts within them, so uh, a value, so that you can actually kind of get a sense more easily. Um, but looking at some of the smaller ones, it's hard to know, you know, what is that value? How can you compare it? If you're looking in this example, um, you know, Indonesia at 15.5 and India at 208, you know, it is would 15 really fit into that India uh, plot, you know, so many numbers of times? Like, is it actually a proportional representation? Um, that's likely the case. So um, it's really difficult to use them to compare, especially comparing against or comparing between figures. So um, in this example here where you're trying to say, you know, Indonesia and 
Tanzania, for example, you know, they look quite similar. It's great that they have those values included in this example, but um, it can be quite difficult to say. Uh, I'm just going to finish this blurb and then I'll get to your question, Brie. Okay. Um, so another way that you could get around this is um, using something like a donut chart. So a donut chart is a, a fantastic alternative um, to the pie chart, um, which gives you um, that extra space. So you can see that the center here is hollowed out. So that's why it's a donut and not a pie. Um, and it basically just helps. Again, this isn't necessarily the, the most ideal format for presenting your data. But if you want sort of the snapshot visualization, a donut chart can be useful if you have a small number of categories and the differences are quite distinct. What you'll notice here is that, um, you know, perhaps uh, the research stream and contract stream faculty, they look quite close, but we've included the percentages um, and we've included each um, the label of each item just outside. So there isn't um, we've gotten rid of the, the legend, which could make it confusing and difficult for people to match up. Um, and we've included the percentages so you can get a sense very quickly, you know, what this little slice represents. So it makes it easier to compare those areas. Um, and this white space also just adds further clarity. Um, where in a pie chart that the, the actual area of the pie slice is not really representative of of what that data is of the number that's that's there. Um, so let me go back to this question. I'm happy to take a first pass if you want. Sure. Um, so, so it's a good question. Do you know? Do bubble plots have have a place somewhere? Um, part of the challenge, kind of in the way that they're generally used. So, if you do want to use them, something that we would recommend that you consider is much of the time when we see bubble plots um, kind of used in kind of widely, um, what we see is that people scale. Um, the diameter or the radius of the circle to the the point value of whatever it is. So if you're, um, you know, trying to compare something that's, I don't know, one versus two, um, using one versus two as the uh, the diameter or the radius will actually result in a much larger area. I think it's like four times the area, um, making the 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 difference look much larger than is actually uh, the case in reality. So if you are trying to use a bubble plot, the goal should be to um, ensure that the total area of the circle corresponds to the value. So it just becomes a much more kind of complex operation. Um, and it tends not to have the visual impact in the same way because we're used to seeing these big differences. And the reason for those big differences is because um, it's kind of misrepresenting the data um, by using it as the diameter or the radius as opposed to the, the full um, kind of area of the circle itself if that makes any sense um so that's one thing to consider it, it it looks a lot less compelling i have tried um using bubble plots in a couple of different uh situations and it just looks a lot less compelling when you're when you're using the area and it's really hard for us to interpret the area of a circle as as a comparative kind of value as opposed to the diameter or radius but then it becomes misrepresentative if that makes sense Please feel free to yeah, no, I, I don't think I was going to cover anything else. I think the, the one other thing is, um, you know, as, this is just one example and we're, we're using it to really highlight the, the flaws of this method. But looking at the bubble plot, um, you know, it's not clear why certain ones have the information included and some of them don't. Um, so if you wanted to really pull out something like, you know, the the situation in India, you know, we're, we're highlighting that it's much larger. What you might want to do is something um, like the suggestions we made earlier. Again, apply some of those tips and, and, and tricks and best practices. So perhaps really pulling out a subset of the data and highlighting um, a small number of countries and changing your title to reflect what it is that you want to focus on. Um, or doing something like pulling out maybe just like the top three and highlighting those and then graying out the other circles so that it's less um, visually distracting. So certainly I think there are ways that you could, if you really wanted to use a bubble plot or a pie chart, there are ways that you could make it better, absolutely. Um, and I think those are, yeah, some of the tips that we suggested earlier would be ways to, to consider that. Okay, 
So next, I want to talk briefly about um, pictographs. Again, this isn't uh, a visualization that we use too often, but we do see it, and in, um, infographs are are around the university everywhere. So um, you'll have seen them in, in your day to day um, and they can be useful. Um, but I just wanna pull out some best practices. So sometimes you'll see something like little figures of a, a, of a person to indicate how many people responded or how many people feel a certain way. Um, don't truncate people. There's no such thing as a half person. That's a very confusing <laughs> thing to say. One and a half people agree with this. Um, again, that's a case for where using a percentage, X percent of respondents or something like that would make more sense. So always use the full image. Um, likewise, if you're using um, a similar example like this, don't distort the images to just to demonstrate that there's you know double the, the amount. <laughs> there's 100 people versus 200 people. The larger one is very confusing. It's, it's one thing to use, um, you know, one image to indicate more than one person. So having this little figure represent 100 people, um, but just doubling it again, it goes back to the issues that we talked about with um, the, the pie charts and the bubbles where it's really hard to interpret area. This figure on the right to me looks like it's at least three times larger than the guy on the left. So um, it's, a, it's quite confusing. Instead, um, you know, match the image and represent it the same way. So um, you can have the single figure represent 100, but then um, double it in terms of the actual uh, icon itself. Um, it's also helpful if you provide a numeric visual for the number of items. So um, in this example here on the left, um, there are 20 squares, but it also has a number um, because maybe you could quickly do the fact that, you know, five rows, five or five rows, oh, five columns in four rows um, is 20. It's nice to just have that number there. It, it doesn't take up too much extra space and it's a quick, quick way to add that if for some reason this visual makes sense. Um, also group the information in a way that's um, easy for people to tally. So like this example above where that single icon is 100 representing 100 people. Um, if you're using a single icon to represent something, make it a number that's easy for people to multiply out. So having um, one purple cube represent seven and then using six cubes, um, people might not be great at doing that math. Um, so try to even out the numbers. And if it's a case where, you know, well, it's really only a small number of um, of things, people, whatever that you want to represent, um, maybe it doesn't make sense to display it in this way. Um, so just some examples to, to highlight, again, really trying to push that ease of processing um, and helping people figure out what, what it is that they're looking for and looking at. Okay, um, so we're gonna talk just a tiny bit about um, visualizing qualitative data. We don't have, oh, sorry, Catherine, I see you have a question, please. Um, you're welcome okay, to Just back, back to the slide before. Yeah. What, because we've all, I'm sure we've all seen a half person or, you know, on these sorts of things. What do you propose in, or what do the best practices propose instead? Yeah, so I would say something like, if, again, if you're looking at something like, if this was on an infographic and you wanted to minimize sort of the data, you might just use like a subset of people. So the, the data itself isn't really translating. So say 56% of your respondents say that they would recommend that this course would be useful for someone else to take. Having 56 little icon or well, it's not 56 icons, say, hard to work backwards from an example, <laughs> say seven students. Uh, can you think of an example that I can translate this to? It's, it's rare that you would have a situation where having an icon represent an actual person would really make the data meaningful. So, you know, if you want to say majority of students felt that this was a useful course, you know, having a single image of a person is not really useful. Um, if you wanna say, you know, seven out of 10 students felt this way, you might choose to do something like have seven students um, 
colored and then the last three grayed out. What I would suggest in that case is just rounding down. So instead of using a half person, just round. Um, so if it's 7.5 out of 10 students, um, because you don't want to say 75 out of 100 or whatever the actual um, responding count was, I would round down because you don't have, it's, it's not a full person agreeing with it, it's a half person agreeing with it, which it's just sort of a weird, it's a weird visual to see. Um, and it doesn't likely give you like an extra oomph to say, like eight and a half people really liked this. Um, you might, it might be a case where having just like, you know, the percentage listed, 85% of, of students indicated that they, this course was useful for their learning of X, Y, and Z topic. Does that help? Is that a... Yeah, it's some good points, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I, I can't think of a case it's, I, I rarely use the, the, the icons, and so I'm trying to think of a case and, and sort of, often it's kind of meant to be more illustrative in the case of like, yeah, seven out of 10, and you would gray out the last few. Um, but again, you wanna use it where you're, you're representing a small enough sample, because say you tallied 42 students in your class, you're not gonna have 42 little people and then gray out you know seven of them or, or whatnot. Um, it's, it's less meaningful. <laughs> yeah, I, I I guess, yeah, if, if, if there's a double personality, then that could be a case for it. I think um, that's a whole other workshop. <laughs> okay, so um, again, we're not gonna spend too much time on the qualitative data side of things. They're, they're um, Unfortunately, that, that's the background that Natasha and I come from is more with the quantitative data, and that's where we, we do often see a lot of sort of these um, issues and concerns come up or people struggling to, to display their data in the best way. But we do have a few suggestions around visualizing um, qualitative data. So word clouds and, or word trees are something that um, I'm sure people have seen or familiar with. Um, they can be helpful to give you a little sort of a snapshot of the themes that emerge. So this tends to be the case where um, perhaps you had students complete um, an open ended question and they were asked, you know, what was the most helpful piece of the course? And what you can do is pull the responses um, into a word cloud. There are lots of websites that will do this for free for you. Um, and they'll just basically highlight what was the most used word or what were the most used words. And then those appear larger on the screen. So in this example, it looks like writing, worksheet, maybe discussion were the top ones. Um, and then things like uh, expectations and guidance were less common. Um, the issue with, with uh, a word cloud or word tree is that it can be difficult to compare frequencies. So we don't really know, you know, was worksheet happening 20 times more than writing was, or um, 20 times fewer, what's sort of, even though you're getting that these were the top responses, you don't really know how frequently they were happening. Um, also, when you plug it into um, one of these word cloud generators, they often just kind of put the data together for you, so you can't really play around as much with things like um, size or shape. Um, so it can be difficult to process them um, based on the orientation or the colors are difficult to see. Um, so what we would suggest instead is you might consider something like grouping the information together. So break the word cloud down into a series of words. So um, this is sort of like the, the start of a thematic analysis in, in looking at, you know, which items go together and what were the types of comments that people had around that. So, um, you can see on the lower left corner here something um, feedback was a really common theme and you know that related to to responses about guidance or guided or expectations or comments um, so it gives you a sense of sort of where people's thoughts were sitting and the type of information um, that they were trying to convey in their responses so breaking it down into a series of smaller word clouds um, gives you a greater sense of the frequency of those responses and different types of themes that were emerging So just another um, example here. So this is a word tree. So this is um, basically the same kind of idea as what's appearing on the right in this last slide, where it's 
taking the data that um, the qualitative data that was provided and breaking it up in a way um, that might be easier to help people understand what was really happening. So what this does is it creates themes. So you can see um, influence, correct, inform, scholarship, writing freedom, writing portfolio, outreach, popularize for myself, add value. So these are sort of the overall themes from the responses. And then um, what's, so this is a tree because sort of the center piece is the root and then um, sort of branches coming out of it. And then responses, um, and often these are direct quotes that relate to that theme. So under the example of influence, um, some of the responses that might have come from that were helping people see the importance of science, promoting tr trust in science, advocating for an issue or cause. So it allows you to organize the data in a way um, that tells you what the main themes are um, and gives some examples of what that theme means. So what does it mean if outreach was a word that people were using quite often or that sort of categorized the, the message that people were giving? Um, it, it provides a little bit more context. Um, like in the previous example with the, um, the word cloud, it doesn't give you a sense of the frequency or how often something is occurring or, or um, like compared, comparing across examples, but it gives you a little bit more context. Um, I'm just seeing some comments. I'm happy to answer. Yeah, so um, Ainsley, it's, it's a good question. How do you break down a large word cloud into themes? Um, so the word cloud example from the last, uh, the, the broken down ones, the big one I kind of threw together uh, for the presentation, but the broken down ones are actually from a real project um, that I worked on with a faculty member. Um, and as I was doing the thematic analysis and pulling out the different um, kind of bits and pieces of what was coming up. So, so the, the example um, here was a, a worksheet implemented in, in labs um, in a science class. And we were looking at kind of just what are the big picture themes of the comments um, that the students were making. And so that we broke it down across those different themes and then um, had created the word clouds as just a way to, just for ourselves, not to disseminate the information, but just for ourselves to kind of get a sense of, of what kinds of things um, were coming up and just just to be able to break it down into those different themes. So um, there were there was um, kind of feedback or there was feedback from the students about receiving feedback um, on their worksheets. There was um, a little bit about kind of how the worksheets were integrated into class and that kind of thing. And so we had just used this as a way for us to kind of sort out our own thoughts and our own themes um, of what was coming up with that project. Um, and so I just made a series of individual word clouds based on um, those those kind of thematic analysis pieces that I had. Um, and then regarding which software, um, so we've got a suggestion in there um, as well. Uh, there are also plenty of online kind of free uh, word cloud generators. Some are better than others, um, but there are quite a lot um, at your disposal. Yeah, I think the thing too with the word clouds and word trees is making a decision on whether, yeah, like Natasha said, like you're going through and doing a thematic analysis first and organizing the data that way, um, in which case, um, so in this example, the word trees is you want to be able to pull out those themes yourself. They're not coming from the responses directly necessarily. Um, it's sort of, you know, you can read the examples that are provided and say, oh, this is all relating to influence. So you're the one creating those subcategories. So it's not coming, basically, like any software is not doing that analysis for you. Um, it's just sort of displaying the information. Did I miss any other questions? Fantastic. Okay. Um, so the next piece I'm going to talk about, again, um, looking at visualizing um, data, is using participant quotes. So this is a nice way um, to really provide context and information about what was learned, um, and um, you can use icons, so here, um, two little figures of people to sort of help readers see that, you know, there, there's something more catchy than just using a quote. And this would be something that would be, you know, you might see on an infographic. So instead of just having the text in quote, you might have a little person and the little um, air bubble to sort of indicate it's, a, it's someone's voice that's sharing it. It really hits home the fact that it's not just, you know, X percent of students said this, but this is actually the feedback they provided about it. Um, one thing to make sure is that you have student permission to share quotes. So in any data that you're collecting, make sure that you let um, students know how that information will be used. Um, 
that's a, a whole separate workshop around gathering consent, but um, regardless of the context, just making sure that you're not using a student's voice without um, their permission to do so. Um, and you can think about how different um, icons can help um, contextualize or strengthen the visualization. So, you know, maybe you have a picture of a smiley face and a sad face and the smiley face is, you know, highlighting what was really appreciated in the, the context of the course or um, the worksheets in this example. And then the sad face, you know, showcases something that could be improved or um, feedback that um, was gathered that, you know, shows how things can, can change. Um, the next one is looking at a combination of mixed data presentation. So uh, I like using this method. Again, it sort of mimics that infographic style in that you're getting a snapshot of a bunch of different information, um, but you're also being able to combine both the qualitative and the quantitative pieces. So um, this is an example about uh, a new peer feedback system. And so um, the question that they were asked probably on a survey was, I'd like to see this system used for giving feedback on other assignments in this course as well. And so it's highlighting 60% um, of the students strongly or somewhat agreed, 10% uh, were neutral and 30% strongly or somewhat disagreed. And then what you see below that is um, mimicking the colors and um, alignment is positive feedback and negative feedback. So on the right, we have some direct student quotes um, about what they liked and why they agreed with that statement or sorry, I think I said on the right, on the left, in the bluey green color. Uh, and then on the right in the orange, um, we have uh, student responses around why they disagreed with that statement. So getting feedback on sort of the positives and the negatives is really important. Um, and including sort of that holistic view of, you know, here's a percentage of the number of students who liked it. So it's not just 60% of students that they liked said that they liked it, but why did they like it? And for the students who didn't, why didn't they like it? It's really important to provide, you know, in, in teaching and learning projects we support, it's rarely, you know, all gold stars and rainbows. There's usually feedback um, that comes with any project. And it's important to highlight those pieces and really showcase what isn't working um, as well as what is working. Okay, so, um, I'm going to talk about a few other best practices, and these are ones that could apply regardless of the type of uh, figure or image you're using. Um, so it could apply to things like bar plots or uh, line plots as well. So um, when looking at the y-axis, you want to make sure that you want to use a scale that doesn't over or under exaggerate the trends or differences. Um, so in this example here, this is the same data that's plotted in multiple ways. Um, so looking at the grade increase over time. Um, and what we see is on the y-axis, each of the y-axes are different. So uh, in the first one, they increment by 20, uh, 25 points, in the second one by five points, and in the third one by 10 points. And so you can see that drastically changes the way that the figure appears. Um, and therefore could, could and would likely um, influence the way someone interprets the data. So if I had only shown you that first figure on the left, you might say, oh, like it doesn't look like there was much of a change happening um, compared to if you just looked at the figure in the middle, you'd say, oh, there's a huge change happening. Um, so just be mindful of how the, those, um, the scale that you're using can impact the way that the data is perceived and understood. Um, so we suggest here the best choice being this one with the 10, the 10 point increment. Um, again, this could be something where, you know, you have a figure, but then you also highlight, you know, over the course of five years, we saw a 15 point grade increase. So adding some context to the information that could come in the form of a title or um, a sub figure category, um, label um, so that the, the data is not only visualized, but also um, explained and sort of what the meaning behind that is. Um, the thing with this too is that you want to make sure that if you're, um, so this is, these are three examples of the same data set, but if you were presenting different data uh, side by side, making sure that you use the same scale for each so that, that uh, you know, in one example, the differences aren't more or less exaggerated. Um, so just being sure that, um, you're mindful of that. Okay, uh, so the last point I want to talk on um, 
around a, another best practice is conveying uncertainty. So data often contains uncertainty. This is often unintentional. <laughs> so um, it's you have uncertainty, but it's not like you're it's not that you're making up the data or that the data isn't accurate. It's that there's just not certainty around how things look. So um, in this, the context of a teaching and learning project, perhaps you're surveying your students and you're getting feedback from a, from a number of students. Um, you want to be clear and, and share what percentage of students completed the survey or task. So, you know, again, if you're saying nine out of 10 students said that they loved this course, but only 10 students responded out of a class of 250, that doesn't really represent likely the entire class's view. So just being mindful of um, what data you have and how you're sharing it. So what proportion of students completed um, the task or the survey or you got gathered feedback from all of those who could have. Um, if possible and when um, you have, you're comfortable or you feel confident in doing so, including error bars or confidence intervals help to showcase variability. So um, this is sort of, you know, when you have the mean of your data, um, what the distribution of responses around the mean is. Um, and I'll show an example of this in just a second. Um, and then also um, when possible and when it makes sense to display the entire distribution, which allows um, for people to have context. So Natasha brought up this point earlier of it's always a good idea to plot the data um, for yourself to get a sense of the, the entire distribution. So this will give you a sense of, you know, are your responses really skewed or are you missing a lot of data or are there some um, outliers in your data? Um, this is a great idea to do, you know, just plot all of your data to see how it looks before you do things like calculate the means and plot those, of, those against each other. Um, so I'm just going to give two examples here. So um, the example on the left is um, that um, an example of that third point, so displaying the entire distribution. Um, so what's happening in this figure is um, the where the lines are is showcasing where the mean is, and then those individual dots showcase individual responses. So you get a good sense of what the skew or the spread of the data is in addition to the mean. So looking at um, this first one, fire, you can see that there's a response that's up at uh, 140K, um, even though the mean sits at around 78. Um, so showcasing the entire spread, um, when you see that compared to um, the, the line on the bottom, arts and entertainment, you can see the spread is quite shorter. So there's a, a wider range of responses. And this can be really informative Again, depending on the context and what it is that you're trying to showcase, what you're trying to share, who your audience is, um, your comfort with plotting this type of data, it can be really helpful to showcase this type of information. An example on the right, um, this is an example around median income. Um, this is an example showcasing um, error bars or confidence bars. So there's a confidence interval around the means. So for each year, um, the line itself showcases the, the mean, so how the, or median, sorry, in this example, the median income year per year, but it also shows a confidence interval around that. So it gives you a sense of the spread of that data. So even though, you know, in the first example, the median was about 45,000, there is some distribution where, you know, if you look at 2012, um, the range of responses is much greater, even though uh, the median is about 55. Okay, so next I'm gonna move on to some issues around um, best practices for color and um, thinking about issues that people have um, with color, color blindness, or just call difficulty with color. Um, and these are considerations that I would, I would really recommend um, you keep in mind, even if you don't have this issue itself, it's important for things like accessibility and inclusion that people can understand and perceive your figures. So um, this is an example using mixed colors for an ordinal scale. So um, students responded to each of these items along the y-axis on a strongly agreed, strongly disagree Likert scale. And you can see each of the items um, has a different color. 
Instead, what I would recommend um, for an item like this is using divergent colors. So strongly agree appears in the darker blue and strongly disagree appears in that darker red. And so you can see as the items, um, as the responses move away from that neutral, they shift in color. So it's a clear sense that the red tones are the, the sort of more negative tones and the blue tones are the more positive ones. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the one on the left is also very eye irritating. Also, just having that mixed match of colors, it's a lot to bounce back and forth. You can't just say, okay, blue is positive or negative. Um, you kind of have to say, okay, this, this darker blue is positive in this, uh, or negative in this other darker blue is positive. So um, it's, it's quite jarring to, to look at. Um, when you're using continuous data, it can be useful to use um, a sequential color. So going from lighter to darker, or darker to lighter, um, to show that increase in values. Um, or using a mix of colors only in the case when you're using um, qualitative or categorical data. So if you're trying, if you're showing showcasing something um, in some of the examples earlier, we had different courses, and those courses would appear in different colors. Although um, the the scale um, based on the scale that you're using. So um, it might make sense to have a subset of courses. So perhaps you're looking at uh, a comparison between arts and science courses. So arts courses maybe would appear in uh, blue and science courses might appear in a green um, so that it sort of creates a visual comparison more easily, even though there's a subset of courses within that. So looking at um, categories and using color to sort of create groupings. Um, Lastly, um, the, the previous slide talked about using color and how to use color effectively, um, but the extra piece is also thinking about color blindness or color sensitivities. So um, I'm not sure if anyone in this group has any color sensitivities, how these display for you visually, but um, these are, so the original is, I don't know what to call that, the raw <laughs> color set. Um, and then the following ones are, um, for different types of color sense, not color sensitivities, color, okay. color blindness. Okay. So um, where people have reduced processing for red contrast, green contrast, or blue, and how those colors appear. So even though they might look very different for you, um, how they would appear for someone else um, might not be the same. So the colors might look quite similar even when they're not, or when you think that they don't. Um, so you can also, um, something that I do quite often is there's a feature, if you're in a web browser, you can um, go into your accessibility features and you can actually simulate how it would look under each of these features, which is a great way to tell if the colors you're using are accessible. Um, or you can do something like print in grayscale, which would give you also a sense of how the figures look. So just some examples of sort of do's and don'ts. So, um, you can see on in this top figure here, um, using a dotted line and labeling the axis helps um, to clarify which pieces of information are tied to each other. So we talked about this previously. So instead of that don't, where um, the data label is included on the side as a legend, um, someone with a color blindness or color sensitivity might not be able to tell those apart, as you can see. Uh, oops. So in the example in the bottom, um, there's a filter applied and you can see that those colors look basically identical. So by including the dashed line, as well as the labels um, kind of pointing out off of the lines themselves, it helps clarify exactly which one is pancakes and which one is waffles. Um, I've also just included um, some information here. Again, we'll share these slides with you. It's a great helpful way to show um, uh, to talk about the importance of considering this. There are also um, many tools online that can help you pick your color subset. So um, in the next slide, um, I'll share some resources and one of them is um, a website that you can select what type of data you're using. So whether it's qualitative or quantitative, whether it's divergent or sequential, um, whether you want to include features like uh, color blindness or high contrast, um, and it'll showcase um, the hex codes for those different colors for you. Um, it's a fantastic tool. I really love that website. It's easy to implement. Um, I have a color database subset that I go to regularly that I use for all of my figures. Um, 
So it's just a, a really handy tool. So with that, I'll pull up the resources. Again, um, we'll share these slides, make sure that they're accessible on the wiki for everyone. Um, so you can go into the links there. Um, but these are just some of the um, some of the content that we talked about today in today's session. And with that, um, I see a question in the chat, so I'm just going to read that. Um, for Likert squares, scales, what's the guidance for which way the scale goes? I read most positive. I read most that positive should be on the right. Um, oh, I see. Positive should be on the right, least positive or negative on the left. But I've seen it used in both directions. Um, this is an interesting question. I don't know that there is like scientific evidence, evidence for one or the other. I would recommend going from the yeah the way you have it. So least positive or, or negative on the left to positive on the right. Um, I think this just makes sense thinking about when you're doing things like if you're going um, and coding the data later on, uh, a lower score representing disagreement and a higher score representing agreement, something positive. Um, it's easier to to process. Um, I think I think that's more natural in terms of how folks read it as well. Um, I think it's more intuitive, but I haven't seen any like hard and fast science on like definitely do it this way. So that would be my recommendation, Jenny, as well. 